Hello, I am Disbrew, and this week we start with news of Overwatch 2, with the beta starting in just two days on April 26th. We begin to get more information about what we'll exactly have on the 26th, and the way that the beta will unfold, with some people talking about an email list, which will run a script through and choose people at random onto how many people they want to actually introduce into the beta, which will change and increase over time, as well as XQC suggesting that beta access will be handed out through Twitch drops. I don't want to spoil the setup of the beta, but I think there's going to be drops or whatever. There's going to be drops. So we have first slot, so we're going to be there the earliest as possible. Whether these will be guaranteed keys depending on how much time you've watched of Twitch, or if it'll turn out to be a random chance just for watching the stream themselves, remains to be seen. But either way, videos were recently published about what we'll be getting and the sort of reworks and new skills that we're having themselves in the actual beta. So we've had an Orisa rework, we've got a Doomfist rework, as well as Sojourn, the new hero, actually coming to the beta itself. There's also been previous data mined references with regards to a battle pass, as well as a guild system, which we don't know whether they'll be in a beta or whether they're just planned for later down the road, but they do seem to be included in the files in some way. All in all, with Overwatch 2 dropping a tank and putting the FPS back into Overwatch, it's going to be very interesting to see the impact that that has on the game. With DPS moving faster, the entire game seems to be getting back to its roots before the shield meta really took hold. And at first glance, I'm quite pleased with that. But it'll be interesting to see on the 26th just how it plays out when we finally get our hands on it. We got new Splatoon 3 information, including a new gameplay trailer of Turf War, as well as a release date of the 9th of September 2022. Featuring a load of new additions from new guns, new maps, and new specials, a lot of which were focused on PvP themselves, which greatly pleases me. I hope that this is a big improvement over Splatoon 2. For me, one of the biggest changes I'm hoping for is that they actually allow you to earn XP in private games as those are what we do on this channel. But for everyone else, it looks like what you're going to get is just Splatoon, but bigger and better. And so that's inevitably going to please the core fans, which is exactly what you want in any sequel. But on top of the gameplay trailer and release date, we also got Nintendo filing a patent specifically to improve Splatoon's minimap. And while it's featured in this tweet, I have to say, I have no idea what I'm even beginning to look at. But the patent filing itself says that this is a minimap based approach to end with the aim to make it easier for players to understand not only their own position, but the position of helpful items and other areas of importance on the map. The aim is that the camera will dynamically shift in response to moment to moment action, pointing to a more responsive camera system for the players. So while I don't know the exact details, I am glad that that's something they're looking at. Third person cameras have always been something that annoyed me, and in Splatoon, anything that can give you more environmental awareness is greatly appreciated. There have been many times in the games where I've thought we're winning the map, only to find out, oh, we lost by miles. And so if they can work on ways to improve that and just general awareness, I'm all for it. Especially if we can get some kind of dynamic middle ground between the actual gameplay camera and then having to just stare at the map from the top down. I quite often suffer from tunnel vision in games, and in Splatoon, doubly so. So quite frankly, I need all the help I can get. We got news last week that Xbox may be considering adding advertisements into their free-to-play games in order to help supplement any sort of microtransaction revenue and help the developers. Now, I'm not totally against this, depending how they're added into the games. They were thinking about doing them through things like billboards along roads and stuff, which wouldn't exactly be too intrusive on the games, but at the same time, depending how they're implemented, could really pull you out of any kind of immersive experience. And I do have questions of whether this would supplement microtransaction revenue, so we had to put up with less microtransactions, or we'd still get the same predatory microtransactions that we get now, they just add in ads on top of that. I do think if we're going to have advertisements, then gamers should actually get something for it. Whether you actually turn advertisements on or off voluntarily, and maybe you get some in-game currency on that. I think there's definitely ways you could integrate them to benefit the players, while also allowing game choice if I don't want to see them because it ruins my immersion. When it comes to stuff like this, I think options and player choice are king. The thing is, though, that was Xbox a week ago, and now PlayStation's considering getting in on the action as well. It looks like no matter which console you're going for, this may be the norm in the future, depending on players' reactions and whether they actually hurt overall growth of the game, I suppose. But it does say that Sony's plans are also to include rewards for players who watch the advertisements, which closely mirrors the way many free-to-play games and apps are currently monetized on mobile platforms. Mobile games are an absolute goldmine for game developers. Even now, if you take a company like Activision Blizzard, a significant chunk of their revenue comes from mobile. And so games companies are desperate to get those same monetization practices to become the norm on PC and console, because if they can, they'll make a ton of money. The issue is, 
Most people deem that mobile revenue practices are incredibly predatory, and it would definitely hurt gaming if it actually came across. We're just lucky that this is the least offensive and abrasive out of any of the mobile practices we've got. So when it comes to ads, well, I think there are ways you could implement them that would either be beneficial to players or at least neutral. I am worried that this is a trend which is going to get worse if we keep going down the path to make PC and console gaming more like mobile, then in the future we could end up with a very, very horrible free-to-play economy which does not value the player at all. And the only way around that is generally to make a lot of noise when this stuff happens, or vote with your feet and just not support the games. But if this is coming in as a very low level at the actual console providers themselves, it does beg the question, how on earth are we meant to get away from this one? After much teasing, it's now confirmed that Warzone is going to get Godzilla and King Kong coming to Caldera on May the 11th. Given Warzone's previous history with the events and the way they've done them, I have to say I'm not as excited as I probably should be. And if this turns out to just be some kind of FMV sequence or an event which you can't interact with where they fight in the middle of the island, I'm going to be quite disappointed. Personally, when it comes to events, I like events that I can play, stuff I can interact with. And so when you go to just giant monsters fighting, which definitely won't impact me at all, I do question how that's going to actually integrate into my gameplay so that I get to do something new. On top of that, you've got the fact that Caldera is awful and I can't stand playing on the map. So uh, hopefully there's something that gets added to Rebirth, so I might actually get some use out of it, I suppose. But I have to say that is my first impressions based off previous events that they've done. Maybe this one will be different. Maybe this will be the turnaround for Warzone that we need. I'm just not going to hold my breath about it. And I think that's part of the issue. We've got this great video, we've got a huge fight, we've got a lot of build-up and teasing to them. We just don't have much information about what they're actually going to bring. And I've never been a fan of reveals that don't provide any information. Hype has to be earned, and if it's just going to be another couple of skins and guns, then quite frankly, it's much of the same, and I don't know what we're adding. Fortnite gets great skins, Fortnite gets great tie-ins to major and IPs, and it gets new content all of the time. New movement abilities, transport, they even removed building recently, it, there were great improvements to the game. And compared to that, it just seems like Warzone and events like these really come across as lacking. So I hope this is good, I hope this is the turnaround for Warzone. I'm just not going to hold my breath. Halo Infinite is languishing in a quite sorry state with its players numbers continuing to drop. The issue is that the developers don't seem to be doing much to actually fix it, or at least not at a pace that would ever bring back players into the game. And with that, we get news that Halo Infinite's delayed online co-op mode now won't arrive till late August. For a feature that should have been in Halo Infinite's launch, delaying it till August, almost a year after Halo Infinite was actually released, is astronomically bad. Especially for a feature that you would think would be so easy. You've already got the single player campaign there. How difficult is it just to add an extra couple of players with you and increase the health of the enemies? But apparently, it oh so difficult is the answer to that one. At least for the Halo Infinite developers at 343. On top of that, they announced their next season. But they also announced that it would be lasting for six months. If you're going to run a live service game, you have to be pumping out constant content all of the time because you want those players to play your game constantly. You want your game to replace all of their other games. And that means you've got to produce as much content as all of their other games do. And Halo Infinite just can't keep up with the pace. A six month season isn't going to keep anyone entertained for six months. And so quite frankly, it's almost pointless to do at this point. The live service of Halo Infinite definitely seems to be underwater at this point, but they have come out with a new mode, which sounds kind of interesting, uh, but people are comparing it to a battle royale, and quite honestly, I'm not even sure how they think they're going to convert one into the other, when they're calling it Last Spartan Standing. Because when I think of a battle royale, I think of 100, 150 players all duking it out right to the end, whereas in Halo Infinite, it's going to be the last player out of 12. And last player out of 12 seems to be the only battle royale aspect out of it, as you start with a special loadout and you get five lives and then essentially just duke it out until the end. And while there is some dynamic elements to it, such as every time you eliminate another spot and you get to upgrade to a more powerful weapon similar to a gun game, it still begs the question, how much of a BR does that really sound like? And I think the answer to me is not much of one. One of the reasons Battle Royales do so well is because it allows content creators and streamers to produce narrative content. It allows people that watch it to get involved in it. But for that to happen, the games have to go on for a certain amount of time with a decent pace. And just 
live, die, respawn isn't that pace that really nails the BR aspect. And so with just a few changes, you can actually end up removing the core fundamental part of what makes a BR worth watching and playing in the first place. And I do think that this does it when it's only got 12 players. I mean, does it sound Halo? Yes, I guess it does. It sounds very arena shooter, which is what Halo is after all. It's just that if people are looking for a battle royale to actually bring the players back to Halo Infinite, I don't think this is it. But for now, that's it from me. Let me know what you thought of any of the topics down in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.